Dayton Audio, a brand that you may not necessarily recognize when you're shopping for a new loudspeaker online or in any retail store, mostly because, well, you're not going to find it in a retail store. However, if you're at all involved in the DIY audio market, Dayton Audio is a name that is synonymous with high value, high performance products. And today we're going to take a look at what happens when a manufacturer of speaker components decides to make their own speaker. Hi, I'm Matt. This is the Ohm Audio channel. And today we are talking about the Dayton Audio MK402X bookshelf loudspeaker. Now, this is actually the second version of this loudspeaker. Originally released in March of 2018, the first version of the speaker received really good praise for its price to performance ratio, but there was some criticism leveraged against it for its slightly tipped up or extremely tipped up, in some cases, top end response. So Dayton Audio took the feedback from their customers and from the reviewers, retooled the speaker and released the X version, which we have with us today. Coming in at just under $79, this speaker is a little bit more expensive than the original version. The extra money that they charge for the speaker from the original version isn't just a simple markup. They actually did spend a little bit more money in the crossover network in order to address that overly bright top end in the original speaker design. Visually speaking, this is the same speaker as the original. You're going to get the same chamfered front end on the front baffle of the speaker. You get the same three quarter inch soft dome tweeter and the same treated paper cone four inch woofer. Uh, the binding posts remain the same. Gold plated five way binding posts with plastic screw caps. And they are still rating this as a four ohm speaker with a frequency response of 60 Hertz to 20 kilohertz. And you do get the same push bin style grill cover. I can't hear you. It's too dark in here. So for my listening impressions, I used a number of different electronics and also a number of different locations throughout my house in order to get a good feel of what these speakers are capable of in all kinds of different situations. At this price point, these speakers are going to be put in all kinds of different places. They're going to be put on shelves, on desks. They might get put on stands. They might get slammed against the wall, used as a surround speaker, which, by the way, do, do a very good job of that. So the first thing is bass. Bass extension for this speaker is actually really quite impressive and even more so considering it's only a four inch driver and a lot of it has to do with the way this driver is designed. You can see that it has a very large rubber surround on the driver and if you were to take a look at the motor structure, the physical magnet on the back of the driver, it's as, lar as large as the cone itself. So it's a very stoutly well built driver that can handle a lot of the bass abuse but you have to keep in mind still, it's only a four inch speaker. While the base extension for a four inch driver is actually pretty impressive, it comes at a cost. Upright bass guitars or upright string basses. Endless fields alive in the wilderness. The particular track I like on that album is called Wolfhead. The upright bass is being played very aggressively in the track. However, when it comes through on these speakers, it comes off as being a little bit soft. You do get the fundamental notes of that bass However, the resonance of the body and just the overall feel and texture of that upright bass is lost on these speakers. So while the note is there, it's definitely sounding like it comes out of a box instead of an actual upright bass playing in front of you. It's one of those situations you can tell you're listening to a speaker and not having a bass played in front of you. The last speakers I looked at, the new Mi BS5s, those actually produced a much more realistic presentation of that upright bass in that album, but that's also using a little bit larger driver. So that old saying of no replacement for displacement definitely comes into play for bass. So because it's a small speaker producing these bass notes, it tends to lack a little bit in the mid range department. So while vocals come through very intelligible and easy to understand, there is information that's left out that makes you feel like you're actually listening to a live performance or having a person in the room singing to you. Again, it just sounds like you're listening to a box playing a vocalist. So once you move past the mid-range, upper mid-range and into the trouble region, things start to get a little bit better. And I think a lot of it has to do with the improved crossover. Now this tweeter, while very detailed, and um, extended, it's not fatiguing, which is a very nice thing to say about a speaker of this price. 
um, speakers at this price point or even a little bit higher, while they might have an elevated treble response, can tend to get very fatiguing very quickly. And simply, I did not find that with the speaker as long as the recording wasn't fatiguing. Now, I will say for sure, this tweeter will show you if you have got some crap gear or some crap recordings. So while this speaker is detailed and will tell you that there's issues in the top end of the recording, it's not gonna shout at you or beat you over the head with it like some kind of a horn-loaded speaker will. It's still a soft dome, it doesn't have a deep waveguide, it's just very detailed, but also a little bit polite about it. So cymbal decays are great. Um, there's a bit of airiness in the room if the recording has it. It's very nice. Um, just be warned, don't play it on a really cheap amp because it'll tell you if you're playing it on a cheap amp. Okay, so let's talk about soundstage and imaging. Where'd that come from? Soundstage and imaging on these things are actually pretty respectable in most cases. These speakers don't like being pushed against a wall for soundstage and imaging. And this is kind of where I had the debate on what I preferred. While the tonality of the speaker, I preferred them about two feet away from a wall. When I pulled them about three to four to five feet into the room, that's when the speakers completely disappeared and produced a much larger soundstage. Um, now, as far as the size of that soundstage, it never really grew as big as some other budget speakers that I've listened to, namely the Numi BS5. I think that speaker threw a better soundstage than the Dayton Audios. Um, soundstage depth, as far as the layering from, you know, from the speakers to behind the speakers, was just adequate. It wasn't the best I've heard. Um, it certainly isn't the worst I've heard either. Now, soundstage width was one area I was actually a little bit let down by these speakers. Because these speakers have a very wide dispersion pattern, I was expecting to have a nice wide soundstage, and that simply wasn't the case. Listening to tracks like Chocolate Chip Trip by Tool, or even some other live binaural live recordings, the size of the space just didn't quite grew to what I have experienced in some other budget speakers, namely the new Mi BS5. So these things are not going to throw a giant soundstage in a small package. And because it is a small package type of a speaker, you're going to be very limited on headroom for these speakers. The sensitivity on these is rated at 84 decibels, but I don't think that's a real number because these things play significantly quieter than the Numi BS5s, which are considered an 86 decibel um, speaker. And because they're only rated at a maximum of 80 watts, you're quite limited on dynamic headroom. So for a simple two channel setup, you're gonna have to play these in a small room. I did use these as a rear surround speaker in my home theater for a while. And they do work fairly well in that. And mainly because you're crossing over a lot of the bass information over to your subwoofers in a home theater. So it does give them a little bit more dynamic headroom than if you're running them full range in like a two channel setup. So if you add in a subwoofer, run these in a 2.1 type of a configuration, I think you'll be a lot more pleased with them. Um, or even in a home theater, but I would not use these as your primary left, right, or center channels because you're just simply going to be limited on output. Surround speakers I think are going to be fine because in most cases your surround speakers are physically closer to your CD position than your left and right channels um, and that's just because we live in reality and rooms are not perfect for movie theaters. All right so let's go ahead geek out a little bit and take a look at some measurements. Nerd alert! Okay let's go ahead pull the band-aid on this and let's take a look at some measurements. First measurement is the on-axis response, and you'll notice that there is a dipped out area from 200 hertz all the way up to about 2500 hertz. And this kind of alludes to why we have a little bit of a recessed feel for vocalists, guitars, bass guitars, all the things we talked about. Um, it softens the impact of drums, it, and it kind of just gives that overall softened feel of that speaker because a lot of the fundamentals for stick hits on drums and so forth kind of happen in this region. And if you take a look at the treble response above that 2500 hertz, you'll see it is much more tame than the original version. The original version had a much, much more accentuated treble response, which actually made it a little bit on the fatiguing side. So this is a much easier to listen to speaker. 
And then taking a look down at the base response, you can see it actually has pretty good, good extension and which kind of jives with Dayton Audio's claims of a 60 hertz bottom end response on the speaker. Okay, the next graph we're going to take a look at is the grill on, grill off. In this case, black is with the grill off, red with the grill on. So if you can, take the grills off and play it. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the horizontal response. And that is when we take the microphone in front of the speaker and then slowly rotate the microphone around the speaker. Um, in this case, the lines are at 10 degree increments. Directly in front of the speaker is black then red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. And you can see that the horizontal response looks fairly clean. Uh, there's nothing super out of the ordinary. There is a little bit of bunching up around the six to seven kilohertz region, um, which can tend to make the speaker sound a little bit brighter, which I did find that to be true. Um, you gotta remember when you're listening to the speaker, even if the speaker is pointed directly at you, that speaker is radiating sounds all directions and will bounce off into the room and come back to your ears. So if there's a lot more information going out into the room that's bouncing off the walls, that's gonna make it back to your ears and accentuate those particular frequencies. Um, now the very top end, of course, everything drops off naturally, so that's all very good. So the next one we're gonna take a look at is the positive vertical response. This is where we take the speaker, microphone at the tweeter, and then slowly raise the microphone at 10 degree increments. Um, again, black, red, orange, yellow, green, blue for the response. And here we do see that there is some dipped out regions right, after, right at the crossover point, which is 3.3 kilohertz. Um, namely at 20 and 30 degrees is when this gets the most out of hand, but then quickly comes back in line around the 40 degree mark. And when you're crossing over this high, that's actually fairly normal to see something like this in the vertical response. Okay, now looking at the negative response, again, taking the microphone, and now this time we're going below the speaker rather than above the speaker. And we are looking at the same color scheme of black, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet. Um, and again, about the only area that's really nasty is at the negative 20 degree mark where we have that significant dip right at the crossover point. All right, congratulations, you made it through the charts, you made it through all the boring stuff, you're at the final thoughts. So what are my final thoughts? My final thoughts are, for $79, if you like a sound that has a little bit of a recessed mid-range with an accentuated top end for a little added detail, these are actually a pretty good speaker for that. While they are a little detail-centric in the top end, they are never at any point very shouty. Now, they do communicate when something's wrong in the recording or something's wrong in your electronics. Um, again, they don't beat you over the head with it. They're not aggressive about it. You know it, but you can still live with it. Now, bass performance on the speaker for a 4-inch driver is actually pretty impressive as far as its extension goes. Um, but you don't just have that same level of texture and tone I would like to have. I honestly like these the best when listening to them at my desktop or in a near field type of situation. They just simply don't have the dynamic headroom to get up and dance and make you really enjoy and engage in the music. Yes, it has an elevated top end on it compared to the mid range, but because that the speaker is very limited on how loud it can play, it just never gets to be an engaging experience for far field or mid field listening. So if you buy these things, stick to near field, stay within a couple feet of them, put them on your desktop, you're gonna like them a lot. They're not gonna make your ears bleed with treble and they're gonna impress you with the amount of bass on them. So that is my review of the Dayton Audio MK402X. Let me know what you guys think down in the comments. We're playing around with the camera work a little bit, trying a little bit different positioning and so forth. Do you like it? Do you hate it? Do you not want to see my nose hairs this close? What? Well, let me know. Um, if you guys like the channel, please consider subscribing. Hit the bell notification icon to be notified when the next video drops. Um, we are on Patreon at patreon.com slash audio channel. Hop on there, take a look, see if you'd like to donate. If not, great. And until then, everybody... Be good to your ears.